Lord, we give you praise. There's only one word here tonight. There's only one word to describe. And only one word here tonight. And only one word to describe. to him. When you are in his presence, there's just one word that encapsulates his majesty, his wisdom, his power, his ability, his grace, his love, his justice. you tonight. Lift your voice to your maker. Ask him for a mighty visitation tonight. We have come to you with all humbleness of heart. Bless us. Ask him to visit you. Ask him to speak to your spirit. The entrance of his word gives light and understanding unto the simple. Our spirits are open tonight, O oh God. Challenge us. Bless us. By the power of the word, we invoke the presence of God, we invoke the wisdom of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for your wisdom in this place. No man can do these things except God be with him. Thank you for bringing your people from far and near. And Lord, I thank you because they will never be the same. Go ahead with the training. Go ahead with the pruning. Go ahead with the building. Go ahead with the furnishing. Go ahead with the empowerment. Until we become that which you have desired for us from the foundations of the earth. Until we become relevant to your program and agenda. In the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Good evening, everybody. Let our hearts be open. The Lord will bless us in the name of Jesus. Turn to your neighbor, greet them, appreciate them, be seated. Hallelujah. 
One more time, I want us to please appreciate all those outside. They are not having the best of everything, uh, but we really appreciate them. Hallelujah. I want us to know that um, it's, it's always an honor, frankly speaking. Every time I step out and I come in, um, there is no ministry without you. Ministry is not a man of God. Ministry is a platform to communicate the realities of the kingdom alongside those who are available and willing to submit to those teachings and those trainings. So there is no ministry without people. No matter how anointed a man of God is, no matter how his depth of light and revelation is, there's got to be people who will listen, who will believe, who will submit to the truth of the word to change them. And it's an awesome, um, it's a very humbling experience when you find people inside, outside, some standing, inconveniencing themselves, subjecting themselves through all kinds of physical, emotional stress and strain as a communication of their desire to know God, their desire to learn. I assure you, the sacrifice that you are making now is the sacrifice that will bring you to a realm of relevance, will bring you to a realm of power. Hallelujah. Sacrifice is a language. It takes a commitment from your heart to desire God. There is no man who truly wants something genuine who will not be willing to pay a price for it. There is nothing that is of value that comes cheap. Nothing. The birth of anything valuable is painful. It is as soon as Zion travails that she will put forth a son. Sacrifice in prayer, sacrifice in commitment, sacrifice in your finances, sacrifice in allowing the word of God to challenge you. We have all kinds of people here. Our mothers are here. Fathers are here. The young people are here. I'm, I'm particularly very challenged, especially when I see our elderly ones, because you would expect that at their age, um, they would just be hanging the boots over life and say, look, I've, I've done it. Whether I did it well or not, at least I've played my part. But you still see that zeal and that passion and that commitment. Hallelujah. It's very important that we do not create a ceremony around our meeting all the time. Um, if you've been here for a while, you know that we totally hate religion. That spirit that draws the life out of anything and leaves you with the form. The Bible says having the form of godliness but denying its power thereof. It says, ever learning, but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. Um, there is knowledge that puffs up when you come around and you keep having rema. A time comes you are so full of the chaff. And it can convince you to think that because you have all those rema, whenever you stand somewhere and they talk about something, you know the Greek word, you know the Hebrew word, and... Many people use those things as spiritual accolades to try to show that they know God. Trust me, none of those things is equal to having the reality of the substance of the experience of knowing God. They are not bad in themselves except that there is a level and a depth of realness and truth that makes every other thing you do in the kingdom relevant. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Is that rain? If there's rain, we have to find a way. Please, I hope the ushers are around. So, if it's rain, we don't want rain to hit the people. We can come and crowd ourselves inside. So, please mobilize them if it's rain. Please come in, come in, come in. Let them find expression. Come with your seats if you can. Can we appreciate them again as they do this? Come with your seats, please. Let's honestly celebrate them. Ushers, just mobilize them. There are spaces in front. 
Um, you can shift in front. Those of you in front, let them have space. Look, gentlemen, stand up. Shift. I'm saying shift and you're watching. Stand up and shift so that they can have uh, space. Welcome them as they come in. God bless you. Sorry about the challenge and the convenience. You're beautiful. You're beautiful. Heaven and earth adore you. Angels bow before you. You're beautiful. You're beautiful. Heaven and earth adore you. Angels bow before you. You're beautiful. You're beautiful. Sing heaven and earth adore you. You're beautiful. 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 You can sit for 10 minutes and stand up and help them. Bring four people in front. They can come and occupy the seat. Don't worry. You are the men and women of God today. Come and balance and enjoy yourself. Hallelujah. Can we pray in the spirit for just two or three minutes while the sound people just help us to fix up everything? Father, we bless you. Go ahead and pray. It's a training ground, so when the need arises, we just make sure you are praying. It's a communication of our passion. How much we love you.
In your name we will rise. In your name we will rise. I don't know. In your name we will rise. I don't know. Lord, we will rise. I don't mind. I don't mind. Yeah. 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 is how men will come from nations to hear the word of the Lord upon your mouth. Yes. You may sit in the rain, but hear me. There are many of you. Hours before your meeting time, you will see people stand because there is something that His Majesty has put upon your mouth. It's not enough to talk. You must have something to say. There must be an anointing is the anointing that will compel people they will leave their nations they will leave their workplaces to come and seek the counsel of the lord upon your lips let it be so in the name of jesus christ hallelujah tonight's teaching is very strategic and very prophetic i want our hearts to be very very open pay attention no distraction those of us standing is a sacrifice. Those sitting, pay attention. Those following us online, pay attention and let's hear what the Lord has for us tonight. I couldn't wait for the time for the meeting because of what I'm about to teach us. Um, I'm always excited coming around, but then there are times that the Lord will put certain things in my spirit and I am always in a hurry to bring them because I cannot wait to see the transformation that will happen in the lives of people as they receive. So before I start, I'd like us to pray one more time and say, Lord, I'm a receiver. My heart is open. My heart is open. My heart is open. I realize that there is a generation that is at the mercy of what I am receiving. Please pray. Many of us in this place will be powerful men and women of God. Pay attention. You are not just listening for yourself. You are listening for the sake 
of the millions nameless faceless people who will be hearing the counsel of God hallelujah now I'm going to talk about a number of things tonight um, I really want to challenge us tonight I'll be teaching us on the principles of effective living principles of effective living Principles of effective living. Hallelujah. The difference. Can I have any two people here? Can come. Um, gentlemen can come. The difference between any two people. Watch this please everyone. The difference between any two people, the difference in the quality of their lives, the difference in the results that they command, the difference between their relevance as far as the program of God is concerned and the quality of their lives is principally dependent please listen not on their backgrounds necessarily not on their educational qualifications necessarily not on their connections necessarily the ultimate determinant of the quality of a man's life here on earth is his ideology your ideology you hear me teach this all the time. The principal determinant of the quality of your life here on earth is your ideology. I don't care what else you have. If you have an ideology that is not consistent with the ways of God, it's called the mind of Christ. If you can pay the price and get what the Bible calls the mind of Christ, then you are qualified to live life to its fullest based on the definition of heaven and even on the definition of earth. It's impossible to fail in life when you have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is God's ideology. The way he thinks, his perspective, his thought pattern. And so through the teachings, I know that we have a lot of impartations and all of that. But impartations become irrelevant when there is no well-constructed channel that can permit them to find expression to the fullest. The anointing of the Holy Spirit is like a dam. Your mindset is like the pipe that is properly channeled for its delivery. Are we together now? No matter how anointed you are, if your mindset, the build up of your ideology is not well constructed so as to allow the fullness of heaven find expression through you, your Christian experience will still be buried irrespective of the dimension of God's glory that you carry. So I want to start off tonight by talking to us about the excellency of a transformed mind. We're going to talk about a number of things. It's a training. We're under serious training. It's an apostolic and a prophetic training. Right? The excellency, the superiority of a transformed mind. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 12, when you read from verse 2, it says... Do not 
be conformed to this world. The Greek word here is aeon. The thinking pattern, the mindset that comes with this age. Do not allow yourself to come into alignment with that kind of ideology. Then it says, but be transformed. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Permit it. Allow it. Allow your mind pass through a system, a spiritual system that will edit you, will upgrade you, will prune you and bring you to a point where your mind, you not only have the word of God, but you become the expression of the living logos. The word logos or the word um, logos is not just the, it's not written word. Is from the word that conveys the thoughts of a man. So when we say Christ is the living logos, the living word, that means that Jesus Christ was the accurate expression of everything the Father was thinking. Everything God was thinking, Jesus was living it out. That's what made him the living logos. And God's ultimate desire, hear me, God's desire ultimately is not for you to become a chief dispenser of revelation is that you become so full of the word that you become an epistle yourself. Your life becomes an expression of the living logos. That your mindset, your life is so aligned that you become an expression of the thought of God for you at time. So God's ultimate desire is not to have exceptional preachers. God's ultimate desire is to bring us to a point where there is such excellency in our ideologies. These two gentlemen perceive life from different standpoints. And the principal motivation that sponsors their perception is their mindset. Are we together now? Bless you. Your ideology. I was teaching the school of ministry students yesterday. And we, we touched on a few things that I taught them yesterday. I just felt very um, impressed in my spirit by the Holy Spirit to incorporate some of those things. Your ideology is the principal motivator of your responses. The way you respond to life, the way you respond to God, please pay attention. The way you respond to situations and circumstances are as a result of your mindset, your ideology, your mentality. Your ideology also sponsors your interpretation. The way you interpret happenings in your life. The way you interpret the occurrences. The way you interpret success. The way you interpret failure. The way you interpret um, people. The way you interpret God. Is a resultant effect of your mindset, your ideology. There are people, for instance, who are under a lot of pressure over their physical appearance, dressing well, um, getting a designer watch, a designer cloth, you know, they are, they are so conscious about those things. That consciousness is stimulated by an ideology. Is that true? Among other reasons, an ideology that informs them that on the strength of wearing expensive things, you are perceived to be valuable. Are we together now? So that ideology stimulates a passion for wanting a lot of things. There are people, for instance, who reject prosperity and embrace poverty because according to their ideology, simplicity is the same as being poor. So in a bid to respond to a desire to be simple, are we, are we together now? They, they reject anything that will make them blessed. You are helplessly a slave of your ideology. You are helplessly a slave of your ideology. 
Your life literally revolves along the plane of your ideology. And therefore, if God wants to step into your life and upgrade you, if God wants to bring you to a point where you are so built that you allow his spirit, the fullness of his essence to find expression in you, then you must be able to submit to him and allow him to change your ideology. Our ideologies are built by many factors. Culture, for instance, I've, I've, I've taught that here. You can get the teachings. Culture have shaped our mindsets. Culture have shaped our perceptions. We see things from a particular vista. In physics, there's what we call refraction, right? I, I taught the School of Ministry students yesterday and I felt a need to just bring that example. There is what we call refraction. When you, when you study physics, there's even what they call a refractive index. Is that true? Um, you have, sorry, those of us who are not science-based, I apologize, but it's a very simple explanation. That on the strength of having a glass block or anything of that nature you look through it and you can see an object it will appear in a distance and in a form that may not be the way it is originally and that is on the strength of what you are looking at let me use an example that all of us can relate with how many of you have seen cars that um, they write something little or the side mirror objects appear larger or smaller than they actually are is that true so the, what you are looking at in that mirror is not exactly the way it is. You may see it bigger than it really is or smaller than it really is. Are you getting the point now? So your interpretation is based on your perception. You must understand this to be successful in life. You must rise to a point where you have what I call a superior ideology. An ideology that is so aligned to the mind of Christ. Many of us do not care about our ideologies. And we labor in the place of prayer. We labor in the place of fasting. We assimilate the word. And then there is such a bank of spiritual treasure. But there is no platform for it to find expression. Because the realities of the spirit are, are like, like power bands. But they, they are dependent on a transformed mind to fully find expression. The degree to which you have the mind of Christ is the degree to which you can allow heavenly things find expression through you. This defines our possibilities in the kingdom. Hallelujah. So you must realize that your ideology is very important. I keep challenging our ideologies because if your ideology does not change, nothing will change in your life, I guarantee you. Not even education will change you. Not marriage will change you. Everywhere you go, you go with your ideology. Anything you do, you do from the standpoint of your ideology. There are some of us, for instance, come if this gentleman, look up please everyone if you can. If this gentleman has an ideology of inferiority, he feels very bad about himself, it doesn't matter how he got that ideology. Did you know that if you look at this guy and say, wow, your suit is beautiful, you're looking sharp, he will interpret your commendation on the strength of his ideology and he will think it's a diplomatic way of mocking him. Is that true? Whereas that's supposed to be a, 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 I mean a good commendation that he should receive with thanksgiving but then it comes and is interpreted on the lens of his ideology and he goes back hating you for doing something right are we together now our mindsets are very important many of us are fighting battles that do not exist today battles that our minds created Many of us are hating people today who do not even know. Our minds created that hatred. There are people under stress that should never be under stress. There are people dying under high blood pressure. Preachers, 
dying because there is a parameter that their ideology has put together. I know men of God who suffer all the time, harass members to try to bring congregations because to them, they feel once you have a crowd like this, is a representation of your anointing. Are we together now? And so they get deceived and rather than focusing to build the people, they do not know that in a congregation like this, success is not measured generally. You pick people one by one to ascertain the extent of the man of God's contribution to their life. You can never generalize a successful congregation. If you want to know how successful Koinonia is, you have to pick men at random and then speak to them on the matters of the kingdom and find out their individual degrees of comprehension. When you gauge the average on their, of their understanding, it represents the extent of my teaching, not the crowd. Are you seeing that now? Yeah. I learned this early in life. So there are pastors who are under pressure and that wrong ideology motivates them into thinking the more I bring in men of God from abroad, the more I bring in this and that, the more there are conferences, the more there are conventions, the more crowds will come. Responding sincerely, but a slave to their ideologies. There are pastors and pastor's wives who are so insecure. If the pastor buys a particular kind of jeep, nobody buys that kind of jeep again because his concept of honor is that you stand alone. Are we together now? There are pastors who the moment they find out that other younger ministers, their training are rising up, they create a spiritual teaching that ensures that they remain at a level and never rise up. Are we together now? So their ideology is informing the activities in their ministry. There are pastors, for instance, who think respect and honor in ministry is when you see a man of God and then you lie down. I'm, I'm not against uh, all of that, but I used to know uh, um, one, one very foolish pastor some years ago who made it a, a rule for his members to kneel down when they see him. No, no, literally, I'm not, I'm not joking. Anywhere in the market, in the rain, once you see him coming, you kneel down. Now, now, you see, listen, listen. Don't laugh. There are still people doing it today. There are churches where the man of God is so insecure. The moment there is anything that looks like a coup against him, they, they go as far as even flogging members. Are we together now? Your life revolves around the quality of your ideology. One person will be celebrating something and another one is destroying it because both of them are looking at the same thing from different perspectives. And so as I challenge you every week, part of the things that the Holy Ghost is doing is to be able to create a divorce between us and the ideologies that have kept us limited. Listen, Many of us think that to make spiritual men, all you have to talk about is the seven rivers that are in heaven or the plain describing the things that are around the white throne. Believe me, believe me when I tell you this, you don't build people that way. You must give people a holistic building that makes them capable in every ramification. The moment you teach people and your, your paradigm to them is lopsided, the limitation of your spiritual understanding reflects on them. Have you seen churches like that? Men of prayer, but broke people. They are reflecting the man of God's bias. He has refused to open them up to that dimension. Or you have a church where people are leaders. They are visionaries. They are businessmen. But they are carnal. They are not spiritual at all. They are excellent. They are exceptional. They are reflecting the bias of the man of God and it's my job under God to make sure don't worry guys please except we have more people outside but those here I think they are, they are a lot comfortable in so we don't have to bring them out it's cold so I don't think the heat is too much any asthmatic patient you are healed in Jesus name Amen. hallelujah so you must challenge yourself to contend for an excellent mindset it is lack of an excellent mindset that makes, for instance, 
men of God fight themselves because they think respect in ministry or in the kingdom based on their mindset is when you stand alone and outshine others. Are we together now? And so the more a man of God stands in a class where he sustains the capacity to outshine others. Right? And so we compare ourselves with ourselves and the Bible says whoever does that is not wise. The question now, before we even start is, are you willing to submit your mindset to be changed? Listen, I really cannot help you if you are unwilling, if you are, un, if you are not malleable enough for your mindset to be transformed. I made a decision years ago and that decision still stands. Anything that is not going to contribute to me, manifesting the fullness of the life and the power of God, serving the Lord with all my heart and blessing my generation, is not worth my pursuit. I will dump it. Including friendships, including ideologies about ministry. If this for me, given by God, represents the highest level of ministry, and this is the dimension that will produce the greatest efficiency in my life, then I do not want to improve. I want to stay here for the sake of that optimal delivery. You must be this passionate about God and you must be passionate enough to submit your mind. Like, like you carry a cloth and you give a dry cleaner. You say, please go and walk on this cloth. Walk on it. How many of you have seen them repaint a car? You've seen them, you know, how, uh, uh, what they call them? The painters, the car painters now. They first take it to a workshop. Is that true? In a bid to paint that car, they can dismantle everything. The lights. Momentarily, the, the, the aesthetics of the car will have to um, be forgotten for a while. You have to remove the bulbs. Remove everything. You have to take away the tires. You have to get all of these things and put together. And then you start spraying. And when you spray, you find out that there are little things. You have to fix up everything. But the moment you are done and you bring out that car, the value increases. That's what God is doing to us. And so you must submit yourself to learn. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Lay your hands on your head and pray for one minute and say, Lord, everything inside this head that needs to change must change. Lift your voice and pray. I'm tired of keeping things in my mind that are responsible for authorizing darkness in my life. I'm tired of holding on to ideologies that are keeping me poor, keeping me powerless, keeping me uh, in lack of character. I am tired of holding on to precepts and ideologies that are making me fail. I am truly, truly determined. Lord, I authorize you to edit my mind. Change my ideologies. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you. Proverbs chapter 1. Very quickly, let's start. We're going to talk about four different areas very quickly. This was a preparatory teaching. Just to get our minds together. Proverbs chapter 1. We'll read from verse 3 and 4. And then we'll commence the teaching. Are you there? Proverbs chapter 1, 3 and 4. If you are there, say amen. Let's be fast. It says to receive the instruction of wisdom. Righteousness. Justice. And equity. Verse 4. It says to give prudence to the simple. The young man, knowledge and discretion. Let's read it to verse 5. A wise man will hear and he will increase in learning. And a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. In other words, he was telling us the motivation behind the writing of the book of Proverbs. That this is the motivation. That every time people who are inclined to wisdom hear it, it will increase them in learning. Hallelujah. I want to challenge your understanding first and foremost about life. 
Write that word down. Your understanding about life. Let's look at the concept of life and living very briefly. I am trusting that God will challenge us and improve the quality of our living. There are certain things you need to know about life for you to live effectively. Number one, life is a gift. Life is a trust. It's important that you are, if you are alive and under the sound of my voice, you realize this. Life is a gift. It doesn't matter whether you acknowledge the giver or not. Life is a gift. Secondly, life is a trust. What is a trust? A trust is something that is committed to you, right? And accountability will be required of it. If you do not know that life is a gift, and if you do not know that life is a trust, then you can live anyhow. When a man takes a bottle of liquor, beer, and just gulps everything, he is expressing his ignorance about understanding that this life is a gift. Statistics, brothers and sisters, tell us, I don't know if it's an old statistic, I, don't, I really don't know what is the current statistics now. But as at the last time I checked, it said eight people die per second. How many people? Eight people die per second. From the time we began this service till now, you can calculate how many people have died. And these people have not died just because they are not Christians or they are backsliders. Pastors have been among them. All kinds of things. This year, for instance, one of our sisters transited to glory. One who had committed herself serving very faithfully in the ministry. It was a time of grief for us, but we rejoiced because she left with an understanding, knowing that life is a gift, and she spent her life serving the king. Let me tell you right now, if no one has told you, the life that you have is a gift. Life is also a trust. The meaning of that is that one day, the real owner of that life will make, he will demand accountability for the use of that life. Drunkard, smoker, gambler, thief, terrorist, preacher, good husband, foolish man, wise man, it doesn't matter. Life is a trust. Look, this should, this, should, this should bring a sense of reverence to you that you are not ultimately, um, you are not the ultimate custodian of your life. You are only a steward of it. It's like a trust, right? It's like a grant. How you give somebody 10,000 naira and you say, start this business. I give you access, but it's not your own. I can call on you at every time to find out what you have done. And it is within my power to withdraw the grant if I see you misusing it. That revelation that your life is a trust alone will sponsor a sense of seriousness, will sponsor a sense of godliness, are we together? And will sponsor a sense of urgency as you live your life. The way people live their lives, especially young people, obviously shows that they are not aware first that life is a gift you watch people come back from a party they come back and they are drunk and the guy is on high speed and he takes one leg and puts it on top of the uh, uh, what do you call it the steering and the guy is just speeding and the ladies in the car are laughing they are saying don't speed and the guy is trying to impress them it's because they are not aware that in one minute that gift can leave the rich fool forgot this. He built bands and kept it together and said, My soul, find rest. And he said, You are a foolish man. This night, today, your soul will be required. Are we together now? Very important. Koinonia, you must understand that if you woke up alive this morning and you are here listening to me, there is someone who gave you only a fool will say in his heart there is no God. No matter how stubborn you are. 
you do not know where the wind you breathe comes from. You have never tried to find out where does the wind store itself. When you sleep in the night, you have never tried to find out where you go to. All you know is that you get up in the morning and you yawn around. But between your time of sleep and your time of waking up, someone was watching you. Are we together? And then you wake up with that arrogant sky, I'm happy to go and look for trouble again. And the one who gave you the life is watching. And the clock of your destiny is ticking. And the devil beguiles you into thinking it does not matter. Oh, it does. Don't let any man deceive you. It does. Oh, I'm going to challenge you. Are we together now? The consciousness that life is a trust alone will make you not to get up and intentionally want to destroy another life. Are we together now? Now, don't feel bad for those of you who have had all kinds of past. We are not talking about that. The blood of Jesus has washed it. But then, I'm not necessarily talking of things like abortion and the rest. When somebody gets up and he says, I like this girl. Sam, leave her alone. She's my girl. And you carry knife to prove your, your passion and the fire that is burning inside your soul. That loss. And you stab Sam and divide him into two. And then you bounce around. And you are going to feel sleepy in the night. Look at. Only a man that does not sleep has a right to claim he is a custodian of his life. Because after everything you do, I will wake up and I promise you I will deal with you. Foolish man. And he goes to sleep. For six hours he does not know what can happen. And then he wakes up and remembers that he planned to kill somebody. Then he goes to do it again. And then he returns tired and he sleeps. And he does that for 10 years, 20 years. And the real owner is just watching. He knows your name. He knows your every thought. He sees each tear that falls. And he hears. You when I call. Life is a gift. Life is a trust. And let me tell you something. Life has a reason. There is a reason why everyone is alive. Whether you know it or not, if there is a restaurant and you do not know there is a restaurant, it doesn't stop the fact that there's food going on there. Is that true? That you are ignorant of the fact that the building you just passed is a restaurant does not mean they will stop cooking because of your ignorance. There is a reason why God kept you alive. You shot yourself with all kinds of injections, but there is a reason why God kept you alive. While you are smoking, you go and doing everything, there is a reason why God kept you alive. Are we together? While you're gulping tatalin, there is a reason why you are alive. Everyone who wants to maximize his life and living must be able to realize that the ultimate purpose of life is to, or the ultimate wisdom as far as living is concerned, is to spend your life serving the Lord and being a blessing to humanity. Any man that spends his time and his life doing this is a wise man. That you spend the entire lifespan of your life, first and foremost realizing that there is a God in heaven. Oh, listen, listen. God consciousness is a key to effective living. The realization that there is God, that, that concept, that understanding, that there is one who is above me. There are people on earth who are stubborn. They don't listen to parents. 
There are people who are stubborn. They don't listen to the law. There are people who are hardened capons. They are occultists. They are criminals. But there is, there is a God that sits in the heavens. And he watches over the affairs of men. You must live with that God consciousness. That the purpose of your living is to commit your entire life serving the Lord and being a blessing to humanity. He told Abraham in Genesis 12, when you read 1 and 2, he says, in thee shall all the families of the earth, not be cursed, be blessed. If you want to live life to its fullest, you must live with eternity in view. Eternity in view. That no matter the quality of your life on earth, you realize that it's only like a measuring tape. Listen, the, 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 the concept of eternity is something that if, if you do not keep reminding yourself, you will live a wasted life here on earth. I guarantee you, whether as a preacher, as just a, a citizen living in the world, a day will come when what we know as existence will be folded like a carpet. Are we together now? And that time is not too far from now. Whether you believe it or not, you must witness it. For sure. Did you know, brothers and sisters, that death is a mirage? There really is nothing. Death like cessation of living. No. Men don't stop living. They only exit this realm. The question has never been, will you spend eternity? You must spend it. The question is location. Not that you, you are going to spend eternity for sure. The question is what? Location. So when you live your life with eternity in view, knowing that all this one that I insult people and abuse people, a day will come, this life will be folded like a curtain. Those who are old people now, 70 years, 80, do you know there was a time they were teenagers? And to them, they felt there was time. But you turn and see them now. All they have to tell you is a legacy of what they did with their own life. I can remember when I went to JS1. I remember clearly one iron box. My father went to go and bring one old box. They repainted it because he didn't want them to boggle it. Heavy box, you can't carry it alone. Yeah. Very clearly. We were going together with my colleagues. They were all crying, missing home. My excitement leaving home knew no bounds. I was happy. I couldn't believe it. I mean, I, I couldn't believe I was going to leave my father. Today, we we'll only laugh about it. But back then, it was serious. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? The same way some of you are sitting down here, you will open your eyes and find out that your son is graduating from the university as a doctor. And you say, please tell me I'm lying. I was in Koinonia yesterday. No, you were in Koinonia 30 years ago, 50 years ago, 60 years ago. Life is very brief. Deceptfully brief. Life is deceptfully brief. And if you don't come into that recognition and that realization that 80 years is not such a big time. 120 years is not such a big time compared to eternity. Eternity minus 120 years is what? James chapter 4, verse 14. This is just the first shot. There are one, two, three, four. Four of these that God is going to give us like a penicillin to really help us. James 4, okay. James 4, 14.
Are we there? Okay, let me read. Whereas ye know not what shall be the next day. He was talking. Let's start reading from verse 13 so that you see the context. 13. Come now, ye that say today or tomorrow we shall go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. 14. Whereas ye know not what shall happen the next day. For what is your life? The apostle is teaching us now. It is even a vapor that appeared for a little time and vanished away. Listen, let me tell you the truth. James really meant what he was saying. I've seen this thing in the realm of the spirit. When you are caught up in the realm of the spirit and you look at earth, you will see it like a vapor. What you call reality is a vapor compared to the realm of the spirit. literally like smoke that will soon vanish you know how when you set a paper on fire smoke just comes and in less than one minute it's gone that's what happens that's why the bible says a thousand years in earth's time is like a day before god one thousand years is like a day before god so from the day you were born till now is still god's today So when you stand up and say, I'm not your mate, in heaven, it's still today. While you are warning people and saying, let me tell you, it's still today. From the day you are born till the day you die, from heaven's view, it's called what? So every time God says today, he knows what he's saying. To you, you think it's tomorrow. Your tomorrow is in God's today. Bless me and see what I will become, they say. We are in today. We are already seeing what you will become. Listen, when you know this, you will truly serve God in truth. That's what makes him an all-wise God. His system of timing is amazing. 1,000 years to one day. So when a preacher starts ministry and 10 years later on, he has left God and he said, Lord, bless me. They are still watching the movie in today. I want you to fast forward life. And you will see the foolishness of men. If there is a way you can record a man's one week. And play that one week in a one hour video. You will know that we are really foolish as we live. All of a sudden you see a man coming to beg. Then the video fast forward, you see him stealing. Then later on, you see him apologizing. Then you see him trying to look for another man's wife. Then you see him do something and you're like, my goodness, is this what we do? That's what we do all the time. You need to live in God's realm of today to see how foolish we live in this life. Is God helping us? If you want to live life to its fullest, you must be guided by three things. Number one, the fear of the Lord. Number two, conscience. Number three, a sense of posterity. Those who live like fools are those who ignore this. Any man who is living to make the most of his life must live with a sense of the fear of the Lord. One. Number two, conscience. Number three, posterity. Psalms 90 verse 12. Let's rush there. Psalms 90 verse 12. Very popular scripture. Psalms 90 verse 12. It says, so teach us to number our days. That we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Teach us to pay attention. Day by day as we live. Let us. Pay attention to our lives. And the Bible says we will apply our hearts unto wisdom. That means if you number your day. And I'm telling you the best time to number your day. Is during your birthday. Where you sit down. It's not just the time to eat cake and talk. It's the time to sit down. And say my goodness. I was 36 years last year. I'm 37 years now. What does that mean? If I'm spending 120 years on earth, 
120 minus 36. This is how long I have to live. What have I justified living 36 years? Oh, I am 50 years. Everybody is saying congratulations. Golden Jubilee, midlife crisis. How many more years do I have to live? Can I justify the 50 years of living? Your heart has been pumping for six years, for 50 years. It, it kept pumping and you were just using the energy it sent to you to do nonsense for 50 years. There must be a change. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, there must be a change. For you to live effectively, you must focus on the things that matter. One of the deceptive things that people do that robs them from effective living is that they major on minor things and they minor on major things. We spend all our time and energy on things that from heaven's perspective are considered minor. Then we give very little attention to the things that we would want to call major. Whereas from heaven's perspective, of, of that we call minor whereas from heaven's perspective there are major things is God speaking to us I'll give you an instance when someone gets up and his whole obsession in life is money marriage house car that, that's everything that drives his life oh I must have a car I must have a house that person is majoring on minor things whereas the nobler things in life like your service and your commitment your testimony and your track record that you love God the sacrifices your commitment in the house of God the things that you have done on account of your faith the lives that you changed the destinies that came to know the Lord Jesus Christ because you were born we minor on those things and so this is what we do. One day we just challenge ourselves and say, three days we are going to be on evangelism. Are you ready? Yes. Then we now go out. And everybody is moving out. And you just block somebody and say, do you know that Jesus is coming soon? Yes. I am testy. The person now says I am testy. You now bring him to the church and he sits down and then you never have a passion for souls again. It was just, it was just a church calendar activity. To fulfill all righteousness you went out for two or three days one one or two people people who are even some of them were already born again you forced them to say the salvation prayer and wrote their names and brought the booklet and said pastor please take your rubbish i got people born again the passion is not genuine how many people have as a major passion for souls i'm not just talking of getting people born again but seeing lives and destinies changed These are the major things in life. What of a testimony? Look at what the Bible says. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. How many people are interested in that kind of business? The business of laying up for yourself treasures in heaven. That when you go to heaven, there's, there's that song, can, can reduce the key. Toss that, that Anglican song, remember? Only remember for what we have done. Play it, Mike. Learn it. Very good song. It's a song that makes you think about your life. When you are living carelessly, it just calls you down. Thus would we pass from the earth and its toiling. Only remembered by what we have done. Only remembered. Thus would we pass from the earth and its toiling. A strange man in the Bible. Listen, the seventh man from creation, the Bible calls him Enoch. This is all that the Bible tells us about Enoch. Never tells us how many wife or wives he married. 
never told us how many cathedrals he built. This is what the Bible says. And Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. Only one more time in scripture we see his prophecy. A man who lived so long and the summation of his existence is that he panted after God in all his life. What a testimony. If all there is in your testimony, your epitaph when you die, the troublemaker has gone. Finally, peace returns to planet Earth. How about that? Let me tell you something. God is my witness. It is never my desire that if Christ tarries and I depart from this world, my ultimate pursuit is not to be associated with mundane things. He started this, he started that, he started koinonia, he started this. All those things are rubbish as far as I'm concerned. All I want to know is how many lives can say, I am a life that was changed. That's the major. The house you built, the suit you died in, does not matter. It's a minor. But you are almost killing your tailor because of it. You are majoring on the minor. I am so glad you came. Yeah. That at the end of my life, somebody can stand and say, it was because of Joshua Selman that I came. Not even in my death. That's the greatest testimony today. If you like, bring one million naira and say, man of God, the grace of God upon your life is like from earth to heaven. I'll just be listening to you. But if you want to turn me on, just tell me how God has used my life to change you. Sir, do you know that I used to be this and that? But see what the Lord has used koinonia messages. I, I can go back shedding tears. If you give me a plot of land, if you give me a car, thank God for those things. But I tell you sincerely, those things are mundane to me. My passion and my desire is to see how much I can have a testimony before my God and my creator that I spent my life serving him as a gratitude to this gift of life that he gave me. Second, that I can be able to be an extension of his influence to contribute my own quota to preparing his army and bring as many people. My desire my desire is to sing your praise to the ends of the earth that we one mighty voice every tribe and tongue rejoices our hearts and our desire is to see the nations worship this is why i sleep this is why i wake up this is why i eat this is why i hate poverty this is why i hate the devil this is why i love people this is my motivation to be able to serve the Lord. That's why my secret place is my greatest asset. Not ministry. I love my secret place more than invitations to minister and whatever. No, 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 no. I love it more than a phone call that can change my life forever. Because when all is said and done. And this world fades like a shadow. There is only one track record. Well done. Thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into my rest. When was the last time you thought about this? If you thought about this, you would have withheld your mouth from blaspheming a man of God or gossiping about a roommate or a worker. Some of these excesses find expression in our lives when we forget. Is God helping us? You must focus on people if you want to live effectively. You must focus on your assignment focus on your business there are people who live their lives and all you are doing is involving yourself with other people's business you have your own life to live and your time is short if god gave you 80 years to spend on earth and you spend 60 years escorting other people in destiny and then you don't even know why you were born you don't know anything about your life let me just shift this if you are here and you are seated listening to me 
and you really cannot tell me in one sentence why you are alive you do not know it's a serious reason it is worth it to go for a retreat and say lord why am i here i'm tired of clapping for other people's vision i'm tired of clapping for other people's destiny he said lo i come in the volume of the book as it has been written of me to do your will not everybody will be a pioneer of a ministry not everybody will be a man of god but even if you are serving in ministry you should be able to know what your assignment is there and commit yourself this is the ideology you must have about life this is the first subject we are dealing with tonight about life these are facts of life that you must know you must live with eternity in view as you go back go and take an inventory on your life what are the things that i spend my 24 hours doing separate them into two majors and minor you will be surprised to see how much of your time you give to the major things the things that matter things that matter we can spend seven hours sitting and daydreaming about rubbish we can spend 10 hours watching movies and films and there's nothing wrong with that but learn to major on the major and minor on the minor by the time you switch them your life is going to be vanity i will never spend my time on something that does not weigh in the scale of eternity i will never waste my time it has nothing to do with me being a preacher you will never see me sit down gossiping about people talking about another man's ministry tearing down people that's not my business there is an urgency the king's business requires haste there is a lot i have i have too many things on my mind to do there are souls to save there are sick bodies to heal there are devils to cast out they must fly out of people's bodies into where they came from there are lives that must be changed there are impartations that must happen to people i occupy my life doing that there are songs to write there are visions to bring there are revelations to bring to the body there's too much to occupy me to waste my life in bitterness and anger and all of and this this competitive thing people do around please get out of that thing Occupy. don't let satan give you a job that god did not give you are we blessed oh so teach us to number our days i want you to leave this place tonight with a new paradigm about life this is a better revelation than just legalistically trying to tell people stop this stop that stop sin when you give them a revelation about the reality of life, the fact that it is a gift and a trust, it will compel them to think and say, what am I doing with my life? As you go back home, go and sit down and think about your life. If you've never done it, please switch off your phone and just sit down or wake up in the middle of the night and just sit down and say, where am I going to? Okay, I'm 35. I'm 45. I'm 50. I'm 20. I'm 17, I'm 10. What am I doing with my life? Number two, the second discussion that we're going to be looking at, I want to teach you an understanding about people. If you want to live effectively, you must understand people. These keys I'm teaching you will make you master effective living. You will live so effectively. Your understanding about people. There are certain things you need to know about people for you to live effectively. If you do not know this, you will fail bitterly in life. Ready? Number one is what I call the fundamental principles of human relation. The fundamental principle of human relation. As far as dealing with people, we're on another subject now. Understanding about people. We've looked at understanding about life. Your understanding about people is an ideology that needs to change for you to live effectively. 
Write this down. I'll keep drumming it to your head till you get it. The highest psychological need, this is what I call the fundamental principle of human relations. The highest psychological need of man is the need to feel loved, the need to feel valued, and the need to feel important. Any man, Christian, Muslim, atheist, Buddhist, the follower of Baha'i, Confucius, whatever, all the religions in the world. Every man today living on the surface of the earth has an inner craving. The greatest psychological craving of any man is the need to be loved, the need to be valued, and the need to feel important. The moment you live your life violating this law, you are going to go through a lot of struggles with people. Are we together now? Um, let me use Amaka. Come, let me use you. Anybody? Come. come on. These are two people. Where are you from? Anambra State. Anambra. Where are you from? Delta. State. Delta. This is Anambra. This is Delta. I need somebody from the north. North. Be sure you are from the north. Don't just stand up and. Okay. Yeah. Sammy can come. Watch this. These people have diverse cultures, diverse ways of living. But can I tell you the truth? Embedded in every one of them, from Delta, from Anambra, from Kaduna State, embedded in every one of them, they crave for it. They will fight for it. Is the ultimate determinant of their attachment to people. The need to feel loved. The need to feel valued. Everybody wants to feel loved. That sense of love. That sense of value. You know what it means to be valued? I've told us but write it again. To be valued means to be given an impression that you are not easily replaceable. That's what it means to be valued. By the time you live your life and you master degrading people and trivializing their worth, you become an enemy to effective living. So if I live my life, watch this. If every time I meet Amaka, all I keep doing to her is to make her feel she's of no worth. Are you getting the point now? I keep making her feel bad I keep making her feel you are a nobody. You are a non-entity. Let me tell you something. She will hate me. She will fight me. She will resent me. Every time I am coming towards her, I become a reflection of pain. Are you getting me? Every time people are celebrating her and she sees Joshua Selman coming, she will hate it. She will leave that environment. Are you getting the point now? Because my presence... Is always derogatory to her person. If I meet this guy right now and I look, I say, I'm richer than you, you are nothing. I push him away and make him look like you have to earn certain things to belong to my class. And I push him away. I devalue him. Are we together? I make him not feel important. The danger of that is that I will never be able to be friends with him. Some of you can never have friends and by extension husbands and wives because your attitude violates the fundamental principle of relationships. Your presence always makes people feel they are nothing. There's something about your ideology that mocks you trivialize the efforts of people. There are ladies like that. Every time you see another lady, you cannot see what is nice. There is a beautiful flower. Your eyes cannot see it. This is a lady that is beautiful. You can't see it. You just look and say, Kai, is this shirt iron or not? Why must your life tilt towards devaluing people? That sense of cynicism is destroying your potential for effective living. You must train yourself to always make people feel loved. When I come to Sam and I say, Sam, I love you. You are a great person. 
I need you to survive. I won't harm you with words from my mouth. I love you. I need you to survive. And when Sam is trying to say, ah, no, I'm not qualified to be to your class, I say, Sam, if there is nothing that is common to all of us, we were all made from dust. There is a common ground. And I love you. You don't need to do anything to end my love. I appreciate you. I know you are growing. And I make Sam feel important. When he sings, I say, Sam, there is an anointing on you. I know I'm anointed, but I cannot but acknowledge the grace upon you. Do you think Sam will want to be around me? Because anytime he's around me, that sense of value is honored. There are many of you brothers who have destroyed the lives of sisters because every time you see them, you are, your, your mouth is like a razor blade. You tear people down. Kai, this girl, true, true. Let's tell the truth. She's not fine. Kai! You may be laughing as if you, you are fine. See it? There are brothers like that. And some are, are, are audacious. This is a lady who is trying to gather herself what? like a broken plate her emotional her em, the emotional self-worth of her of her person is fragile she's gone through a family that did not believe in her now she came to koinonia or to any um congregation of god's people and she's hoping she will find a place where she can heal and be strong and one arrogant carnal brother now comes to smash that thing on the ground and says, I'm telling you to your face, you are anointed, oh, I won't deny that one. But find it now. You have, you have, no. Thank you. If that is part of your life, you are not living effectively. Because the reason why somebody is dying is because you are alive. And God is watching. God is watching. You cannot come and destroy God's precious creation. Are you getting what I'm saying now? Yeah. Never make people feel bad when you are there. No. You live effectively when you understand this component of people. Sisters, may God give you a husband who thinks like this. Somebody who you come back home and he can appreciate you. When you cook, he doesn't look and say, why is there four meat? I thought you used to put five. Say, no, I thank God. I just came back from somewhere and my husband's wife beat him. I thank God for a woman like you. Never giving me a headache. And she's saying, I'm sorry. I shouted at you that day. Say, no, we are humans. Not that you're a bad man. You say, yes, you shouted. No. If you understand people, let me tell you, you will become a people magnet. It will be like charm. You become desirable. By even your enemies because you have sustained the component that attracts people the, the excellency of your ideology is such that everyone wants to be like you why is everybody running away from you it may be because there is something about your life are we together now you think they are running away because you are poor not necessarily trust me not necessarily there is something about your life that violates their sense of self-worth I need you to serve. I won't harm you with words from my mouth. I love you. I need you to survive. Very important. Bless you. Bless you. You greet people. When you come, you greet people. They don't just come and say, Apostle, how are you? Say, hey, I'm fine. Courtesy. Are we together? The highest psychological need of man is the need to feel loved, the need to feel valued, the need to feel important. The second thing you need to know about people to live effectively. Ready? You must be aware of the inconsistencies and the ever-changing nature of man. Oh, I teach you wisdom tonight. Be aware of the inconsistencies and the ever-changing nature of man expect people to change expect people to change whether for the good or for the worst if you do not factor this you will die of hypertension as you live in your life <laughs> hmm. 
expect people to change. Factor this as you deal with people. How many people come back with shock? I used to know this lady when she was nothing. Very humble, very loving. Now because she bought BMW X series, now she's arrogant. Expect people to change. Incorporate it so that you are never shocked. There are few things about people that surprise me because I factor it. There are people who used to greet me years ago. They will see me and greet me. But now I see them and you see there's this unconscious, I'm also a man of God now. And I just see them as I expected it. Carry your wahala. There's one song, owner of evil load. Carry your load. Now I don't mean that for the people, but I mean, come on. I reject any load that God didn't give me. Carry your wahala, your mindset, and your village, whatever, go with it. I don't want trouble. Our not understanding that change is something to be expected, even in people, is what surprises us. So as at the time you asked the lady out, she was a charming, sleeping beauty. Lovely lady, she would greet you. It was because she was not exposed. Now, some exposure has come. And one day she challenges you and you say, me, when did you change? If you don't factor it, you will die like mere men. How, how many times do we expect people to remain the way we've always known them? Let me tell you, if you want to live effectively, incorporate this people are inconsistent they are ever changing somebody will say i love you today tomorrow he will say crucify him let it not shock you factor it and you will be free so that if your best friend today turns and stabs you at the back i i i, I some some years ago i managed one issue one guy liked one lady one good christian lady and there was one middle man who was trying to process the whole relationship and in the process of trying to uh, do the procession i don't know how the thing worked and the guy started you know was possessing his canaan for himself and so on and so forth and he found out that they were spending time together and the returns that would have come from the whole i mean the guy was not nothing was happening and at a point he just said look this lady says she doesn't like you long and short i've just been afraid of telling you but now see it as hot as it is and then a few weeks they were all going out and then of course you can imagine how that relationship too will end praise the lord but the idea is that when was the last time some of you listen as you are sitting down right here you are bitter and you are depressed because people changed your father changed when his salary came when his arrears of 10 years came no more prayers remember when people used to come and pray they forced you to wake up in the night and do night vigil you killed everything flying around your house till that money came. When it arrived, your father became himself. He apologized to the family. If I've offended anybody, if that's what is stopping the money, I apologize. And you were convinced, my goodness, daddy has changed. All of a sudden, the money came and you found out there is no change that has happened. Listen, learn this about people and you will win. The inconsistencies and the ever-changing nature. Man, the only thing that God guaranteed about man is that he will change. People change when they are under pressure. That's why, let me tell you something. I say this thing especially because we are predominantly young people. When you see somebody, that thing you call love at first sight, be careful. Because if you say you love me, have you seen me when I'm angry? Have you seen me when I'm hungry? Do you know whether I snore? Do you know whether I'm dirty? When you say you love me, it means you love everything about me. Oh, I love you, I love you. Calm down. My mother is a witch, I love you. I love you like that. Calm down. Our, our refusal to understand people. Listen, I'm giving you wisdom that will guarantee your reigning. You will live effectively. Know that people change. Are you getting what I'm saying now? How many pastors expect their subordinates not to change? And they say, I know you. You are like a son to me. You came into this church as an armed robber. See what God used my anointing to do in your life. And you are the very person who wants to divide my church into half. <laughs> people must change. For the good or for the worst. I have factored this in my life. Let me tell you, 
there is almost nothing anybody around me does that surprises me. I may just be alarmed. What kills people, what causes high blood pressure is the shock. The shock. I didn't expect this person to change. Come on. <laughs> I give you a key that will make you live effectively. Are you learning this? When you expect people to change and you factor it, you are never surprised. That means when you are designing your life, you design it incorporating the fact that people can change. That way, you will never trust any human being above God, no matter what they tell you. I will fall inside the well for you. I will, a train will kill me for you. You are talking nonsense. Let an arm robber knock the door. You will see the ever-changing nature and the inconsistencies of people. There are pastors that before they got money, they were preaching certain messages. Is that true? When money came, business class, first class, five-star hotel. Ah! They said, so life can be lived at a higher level. And that thing altered their messages. And the members say, Kai, I'm disappointed. Don't be disappointed. People change. Walk out with this today. And you can shake hands with your best friend who stabbed you at the back. And say, I know I offended you and you laughed. He said, I've learned to factor in the ever-changing nature. So when a guy walks to you, somebody who says, if I don't marry you, just come and carry my dead body. And two weeks later, he says, I'm not doing again. You will start asking him, what happened? What is on your head? People change. So you factor it in your heart. Listen, this is the antidote to consistent disappointment. I will give you a job. What level are you now? 400 level. I promise you, I'm now the DG of this and that. And then you come after that time and say, even your father have not given him a job. Talk more of it. Walk out of this office. And you say, ah, ah. All the while, when they are prophesying in miracle service, you never drop prayer requests of job. Because to you, you think it's a done deal. That man promised me. And we are saying, don't put your strength in man. You are not hearing. Until he sends you away, you will rush with the prayer request. And come and drop it. Oh God, a job. Listen, I will never trust man above God. Never. I don't care what my father, your father may let you down. Your mother, your best friend. What's the other part? But Jesus. That's right. Your boss. Your lecturer may let you down. Your project may let you down. But Jesus never Your certificate may let you down. Your husband may let you down. Nigeria may let you down. But Jesus never Hallelujah. Understand the inconsistencies and the ever-changing nature of men. This is the key to not living in bitterness. I, I love this person so much and he went behind me and stabbed my back. Factor it and rest. Jesus never said on the cross, disciples, where are you? You left me. He didn't have time for that. John, thank you for coming. Take care of my mother for me. He never woke up and said, you, Peter. <laughs> you, uh, um, Nathaniel. Nathaniel, you that I saw you close to a tree. No, that's what many of you do. <laughs> Number three, under understanding people. You must understand what I call the motivation of the natural man. If you want to live with people, you must know what motivates the natural man. And I want to tell you now. There are three things that motivate the natural man. Fear, greed, and self-centeredness. Factor that as you live with people. The natural man is only driven by three things. One, fear. Two, greed. Three, self-centeredness hmm. 
if you don't know this, you will be deceived. The concept of celebrity really does not exist. People only celebrate you to the degree to which they found something in your life that is valuable to them. The day they don't find it, they will dump you for the next thing. The natural man is motivated. Friendship in the world, fraternities and associations are ultimately motivated by fear, by greed, and by self-centeredness. Watch this. I taught the school of ministry three kinds of people with respect to, there are three categories of people in life with respect to relationships. And let me just bring it out and teach us. Watch this. The first category of people that you will relate with in your life are those who don't love you or love you, believe in you, clap for you only because of what you carry, not who you are. They don't love you because of who you are. They love you because of what you have that they need so desperately. So your presence represents the availability of that thing. So they keep loving you for the sake of what they want. Are you getting what I'm saying now? When you see an anointed man and you run around him and say you are anointed, you really do not love him. You only love what his presence brings in your life. The day I was telling the school of ministry students, the day we do two koinonia services and you don't sense any anointing, you sense the service go bad. Many of you say I said it. Hey, the charm, the charm has scattered. How many, listen, how many of you seated here, if I'm preaching right now and in your presence, a charm, God forbid, but let's assume that I'm carrying a real charm and it just falls out here. Let me tell you, some of you who shouted, I love you, Joshua Selman, you are my father, you are my mother, you are my uncle, you are all of this. At once, at once, you are the ones who go and call the police and say something is wrong. Let's, let's join the president in fighting corruption <laughs> in Nigeria. Ninety percent of the people who will come to your life who will love you and call you names only love what you carry not you if you are not aware of this the crowd will deceive you when men clap for you they are clapping for what you carry that they need even if you still have it the day they don't need it you will dump it look at what we have done for nitel nitel that labored for nigeria for many years look at what we have done to railway look at what we have done to typewriters look at what we have done to cafes Look at what we have done to Nokia 3310. That's an example. There was a time that represented our obsession. It's the same thing you will do to your Android device in the next 10 years. It's the same thing you will do to your tab. You will throw it away. Young children like this don't even know what a typewriter is. Whether electric or manual, they don't know it. Are we together? Yeah. So when you see people celebrating you, don't get carried away that they're admiring you. You say, I'm a superstar. Joking. Joking. You are only a commodity that is desperately needed. And people are leeching on you to eat their pound of flesh while they can. For as long as what you carry is needed by them, they will keep loving you. The first category of people you meet many of us are under deception right now that's what i teach the leaders i hear many of you come and greet and, and, and i'm not saying you should do it oh i want to thank my father apostle joshua selman and i'm just looking at you while you are saying it i want to appreciate the head of the department prayer band and everybody shouting oh the day you try to get people filled with the holy spirit and you lay hands and lay your legs and nothing happens they'll start saying this department is like we're backsliding the, the prayer the anointing on this department is not as strong as it used to be before. Gradually, gradually. Listen, when you know this, you will celebrate people, but you will learn to love yourself because ultimately you are your biggest fan. At least you are the one that trusts yourself. By the time you stop loving yourself and allow people love you, the day they leave, you will die of loneliness. Job was left alone. And he said, I know my redeemer, leave it all. I've lost everything. 
but I will love myself. Many of us are here right now. How many of you started fellowships and started groups? Or maybe were pastors of fellowships. And as at the time you were working with the people, most of the people you were grooming and building were not spiritual people. But now all of them have revelation. And everybody pushes you away and you are feeling disappointed. There's no throne for you again. My brother, save yourself headache. I'm giving you freedom. Go and find a way of motivating yourself and keep loving God. For as long as people see something in you that they want. I asked the school of ministry students a question and I'm going to ask you to prove that the love of man is sensual and carnal. How many of you tell me the name of two imbeciles you can remember? Ready? Those are the ones that have nothing to offer to you. You can't even remember their face. When was the last time when you visited them to charity, you only visited them to show the world you are doing well, you are all of that. They poured saliva on you, thank God. How long can you endure that? You just endured it for the moment. That's to prove to you our love is principally self-centered. Number two, the second category of people you will meet in your life are those who do not love you. Don't confuse this. The first category, they love you. They celebrate you, but the motivation is for themselves. The second category, they don't love you, they don't believe in you, but because there is an enemy they have to confront, and they need your cooperation to destroy that bigger enemy. They will come into a momentary partnership with you to help them fight that bigger enemy. When the enemy is defeated, they return to themselves. Are we together? A funny example. During crisis post-election violence or religious crisis how many of you love people that smoke ego how many of you love people that do this but the moment there is crisis what happens because those guys are the ones who put the headband and go to fight for christians you now motivate them and say my children go <laughs> do you love them no do you believe in them no but there is now a bigger enemy you don't care their church in fact sometimes you even give them some money and say hey, take minerals you know what they will do with that money but you are saying take minerals right and you tell them please as you are protecting come around my house make sure that everything is working well do you love them no do you believe in them you have warned them two weeks before the crisis they should not come near your house you will shoot them if you see them now because you are afraid that a bigger enemy will kill you you are now using them momentarily to help you fight that bigger enemy and afterwards, you hate them back. When you want to move to a new place, a new house, you want to find out, are there Christians there? Now, you may hate Catholics, you may hate Anglicans, you may hate Pentecostals, but because you want to be at least in a place of safety, you now say, are they Christians? You don't know what, what they believe. If they say, your neighbor is a Christian, the other one is a Christian, you say, ah, I'm happy. Immediately you enter, that problem has been solved. Now! You hear this guy praying in the night. You say, Mr. Man, I'm here. I will warn you. you. It's your church that prays like that. Continue. You see that? The difference has come. You needed them momentarily. Do you understand what I'm saying now? How many people come into partnership with you just because they want to fight a bigger enemy? I've seen people who don't love me. They don't believe in me. They, many of them may have said a lot of things about me. But when certain inevitable diseases came upon their lives, oppression they saw people appearing day and night and telling them you would die they tried everything they would do right and then they would now come and you see them say man of god honestly kai may god bless you you are doing a serious work and i can discern that these people they will be the people to stab me but because there is a bigger enemy they need to come into partnership with my anointing and solve the problem after which they return back to their mood if you do not know this about people you will be deceived you will suddenly see your enemy at peace with you. He's at peace with you because there is a bigger enemy. Learn this and be wise. Are we together? The third category of people that you will meet in your life are those who will love you for who you are. They will die with you. They love you more than your money. They love you more than your anointing. 
they will be the last sets of people to give up on you. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. I told the school of ministry students yesterday and they were shocked. If you find 10 of these people in your life, you are the luckiest person who has lived. Don't answer it now. Answer me when you are 60 years old. If you find 10 of this third category of people, like Ruth to Naomi, who will say your God will be my God. If you fail, I fail with you. If they mock you, they mock us together. You may never find those people. I pray for you. May, may that person be your husband or your wife. Because if, if that, that category, have you not seen husbands that left their wives when there was trouble? There was one man who gave birth to six children. He was looking for a boy. First, twins, girls. Second, twins, girls. He said, let's try again. Third, twins, and he ran away because he could not find. I mean, it was on news. They had to look for him and see him standing as if he was not the one responsible for the children. That's what people do. A man can be that self-centered to run away from his own children and his own wife. If you learn these three things I shared with you, you have mastered people. Maybe I'll just talk on one more area and then we'll round up. This, I may stop here and we'll continue um, the next time. Your understanding about failure. Mm. Make sure you get this. You must have an understanding about failure, about setbacks, about challenges for you to be able to live effectively. Ready? Right, let's fly. On your path to success, failures, challenges, setbacks are inevitable. Write it down. On your path to success, you must fail. You must have challenges. You must have setbacks. If you do not know this, you will be discouraged. You will die. Champions in life are not people who were not confronted by failures. They are those who knew the things that I'm teaching you now. Your failures are doorways to lasting and sustainable success. Write it down. Your failures are doorways to lasting and sustainable success. I want to change your mindset about your failures. Now, I sense God ministering to people very personally because there are lots of people that have failed and you need somebody to explain to you what is happening in your life. Your failures are what? The door, the very door that opens you up to success is called failure. That's the name of the door. If you reject that door, you reject success. I do not know any successful man who has lived in this life who has not failed. Let's see what James told us. James chapter 1 verse 2 and 3. Write this down while they project that scripture. Failure is a priceless asset. Failure is a priceless asset. Nothing can buy it. Failure is a priceless asset. Everyone say, it. failure is a priceless asset. James chapter 1, we'll read 2 to 3. Ready? Let's read together as projected. 1 to read. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. See, he's saying rejoice. The same way you rejoice if somebody gives you a check. He says when you fail, don't cry. Rejoice. Knowing this, this is why you rejoice. That the trying of your faith work at what? patience let's look at verse 4 it says verse 4 please but let patience have his perfect work and then <laughs> read on sorry about the media but you get the point failure is a priceless asset because it teaches you patience 
There is no other way to learn patience on your path to success. Number two, failure teaches you discipline. Discipline. When you hear people brag and they are arrogant on the path to success, just leave them. Failure will bring them to a point of discipline, I guarantee you. Failure brings humility. When you fail on the path to success, it brings humility. When you hear a man talking around, bragging, my money, my education, my this, is because they have not failed. Give them room. Come to meet them 10 years later and they will see you even as a millionaire and say, good afternoon, sir. And you're like, ah, my brother, what happened to you? Failure. Teaching men humility. Failure teaches you compassion for others because you have a foretaste of how hard it is. Right? The reason why many people are quick to castigate others. You are quick to look at a drunkard and castigate him. You are quick to look at a lady and say you are a terrible lady. You are an embarrassment to everybody. It's because you have not failed. When people fail, they develop compassion for others. We do not have a high priest who has not been touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Why? Because he was in every way like us, tempted. The only, let me tell you something about failure. Failure is a sign that you have started moving to the realm of success. You never fail if you are not moving. Failure confirms that you are moving. Ah! Let me tell you something. I will never listen to a man who has not failed. I don't care what you have accomplished. If you have not failed, you don't have a message for me. You don't have the balance. Failure gives you balance. People who have never failed are arrogant. When you see somebody just comes into the anointing, you hear him talk, God forbid. Can you imagine? I'm embarrassed. I don't know why pastors don't have a crowd. I mean, in three days, we have grown from two people to 20. Just let him continue. Don't tell him anything continue you come back after one year and you say i don't know why people will trust you today and next week they won't trust you again failure is teaching him a good lesson at the end of three years he says look it doesn't matter crowd or no crowd serve god failure has taught him look at the transition from a pompous and an arrogant person to a disappointed fellow to one who has stepped into it Micah chapter 7 verse 8 is an encouragement for someone. Rejoice not over me, my enemies. Though I fall, yet I will rise again. We hate failure because of the mockery that comes with it. We hate failure because of the embarrassment that comes with it. Now listen, this failure I'm talking about is not just failure caused by witches and wizards. This is a necessary and sufficient condition. For you to become successful you must fail rejoice not against me oh my enemy he says when i fall what will happen everyone prophesy to yourself i shall rise, I shall rise. say when I, fall. when I fall he never said if i fall <laughs> he never said if i fall he said when i fall i shall rise he said when i sit in darkness the lord shall be a light unto me I like to see people who have failed in life. They are the ones who are champions. Failures and challenges are only indications that your current level of understanding has reached its limit and you will need to upgrade. Hear this. Your failure in life is only showing you that the principles that you know have exhausted their validity and can no longer take you beyond that reach. Are you getting what I'm saying now? When you fail, it's a sign that what you know, what you understand, what you believe has reached its limit. Meaning you will need another kind of knowledge, another kind of understanding 
to pick you and continue with you. That's what it means. Failures are the ultimate motivators for success. Oh, how true. Nothing motivates you to succeed like failure. Failing will motivate you more than counseling. It will motivate you more than encouragement. When you fail in that cave of Adulam, like David, there was a time David ran away from Saul. You would have called him a failure when he sat down at the cave of Adulam. It was at that point, certain things began to happen in his life. Is God speaking to us? Failure prunes and edits your relationships. You never know who people are until you fail. Failure edits your relationships. It takes away psychophants from your life. It, 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 it leaves the remnant in your life who love you truly for who you are. Are we together? Listen, let me tell you something. Failure has monetary value. Failure is that needed. In itself, you can become rich by failing. There is a level to which you fail so much in life. Your failure becomes the testament that helps other people to jump that path and they will pay you for it. So your failures are not a waste. Remove the shame the stigma and the embarrassment that come with failure, but treasure the experience. Is God speaking to us tonight? Take away the shame. I know that failure comes with shame. I know what it means to organize a program and publicize, and in your vision, you saw an overflow. But then, two hours into the program, that's when the 11th person comes into the meeting. It may look like failure, but at that point, it can give you an opportunity. Remove the shame. Remove the embarrassment. Take away all those things but preserve the experience. Because the day a crowd comes, you will glean from that experience to become your instrument of thanksgiving. When you see preachers roll on the floor and thank God, they know what God did to them when no one was watching them. Are you getting the point now? Yeah. Yeah. How do you deal with failure? Number one, never be ashamed of it. Don't let any man make you ashamed of failure. Honest failure that happened on your path to success. No. No. Learn from them and rise to a realm of success. Learn from them. You never conquer failure until you learn the lesson from it. If you do not, you will keep repeating it for ages you conquer failure when you receive failures listen listen to me watch this watch this let me tell you something failure is like a parcel from the gate of success to your current level a parcel contains a letter in it that letter is the secret to your continuity in that part but it comes as failure just like you send a messenger with a letter when you open it you will see in it the secret to continue your journey. Failure is like a compass. It has in it a road map and a compass. When you get to a point in your life where you fail, check well, there is a parcel. Open it up and it will tell you turn left and you begin to move and you continue your journey. You can ignore the parcel out of shame and you never will get to the place of success. One scripture and then we'll run away. But let me just give you two scriptures. Job 14 from verse 7 to 9. The Bible says there is hope for a tree. Oh, I bring a message of hope for people who have failed. There are people who have really failed. There are some people who probably wrote jam or wrote post-UME or wrote other things. There are people who may have to spill over, stay an extra year. There are those who have finished, you graduated, you paid the price, but there is no job. All these things look like indications of failure. Tonight, I want you to go to the treasure 
where you keep the most valuable things in your life and pick your failures and add it to your treasures. Otherwise, you are missing a lot. Don't throw your failure away. It's a priceless gem. Media, please give us Amos chapter 3 verse 12. Let me give you two scriptures. Job 14, 7 to 9. And then Genesis 50 verse 20. Remember what Joseph told his brothers. He said, you meant it for evil. But God has turned it around for my good. For the salvation of others. In other words, you wanted to sell me out of jealousy. It doesn't matter what made you fail. It may be your personal cause. It may be envy. It may be whatever. It doesn't matter. Verse 12. Okay, we have it. Now, read this very interesting scripture. He said, Thus saith the Lord. This is a message of hope for somebody tonight. As the shepherd taketh out of the mouth of the lion two legs or a piece of ear. Look at this. A lion has devoured a sheep to a point that it ate the whole body. All that was left is two legs and ear. Yet the shepherd still fought to recover it. Because he still felt that there is still hope for that sheep. This is what the Bible is saying. He said in the same way, a shepherd, by the time it has eaten the stomach down to everything, there is no life again. But the shepherd said, I will not give up on this sheep. This sheep can come back. Because if you can have an ear to hear the word, faith comes by hearing and if you can have your feet to take steps of obedience there is no situation that cannot change it says the same way a shepherd you would imagine that after a lion has devoted that's the apex of failure at the mouth at the eyes at the heart at the lungs and the shepherd said i know that there are only two legs left and one ear that's all I need to get that sheep back. And here to hear the word of the Lord and a fit to take steps. If you can continue the journey and not give up, you will arrive. Hmm. Who is God speaking to tonight? What brought you to give up? You started very well. Simply because you did not see results. Many of you are about to give up. I know that you have 10 carryovers right now. You are even on probation. You are on your way out. You are not as bad as this. But they said the shepherd will not give up. Who is God speaking to? You have written jam for seven times. Everybody around you is telling you, your God is not alive. This your Christianity thing is making you an idiot. There are people who even think it is because you are spiritual that you are failing. Just allow God to finish what he's doing in your life. When he beautifies you, when he adores you, when he makes a masterpiece out of you, then men will know that the rejected stone, while you are paying the price, they will laugh at you. Don't worry, don't hate them. While you are going through the valley of the shadow of death, while it looks like the sun will never shine, I want you to know that if there is night, there is day. He says, and the evening came and the morning came. If you see the evening, they were tied together. You can't see evening without morning. If you see evening, it means morning is on its way coming. He'll lead me and guide me to the city of Papa. He'll lead me and guide me to my place of destiny. He'll lead me and guide me to the city of Papa. He'll lead Listen, your failure is your passcode to enter the gates of success. When the gate is about to open it, to say, show me. Show me the code. And you say, see my scars. There is a scar. I didn't just come, I cried. I had times of discouragement. I had times when I never thought the sun would shine. But here I'm standing. I almost... Able. I was right at the edge of a breakthrough but couldn't see That's what God is speaking to someone here My problems held me down 
depression. But he kept me, so I would let go. 37 years. And they've told you, madam, better just go and get pregnant and have a child, at least. Listen, change your interpretation about failure. Tonight, as you pray, thank God for your failures. It's made me wiser. It's made me better. It's made me understand people. Now I can reach out to others and say, Sam, you can make it. You are not the only one who is there. When David was in the cave of Adullam, the Bible says there came to him people who were weak, people who were in debt, people who were depressed, and he made warriors out of them. It's in the place of your failure. Some of you will get your husband. You will get a godly man because there is nothing to desire from you. And somebody comes. Genuinely. Run away from people who show you success without failure. The next time you see a great man, beg him to show you his cars, not his crown. His cars. The symbol of royalty in the school of greatness is not crown. Crown is an evidence to followers. Leaders lead with scars. They lift up their clothes and say, see my scars. There were times I was tightened for years. It looked like the heavens were closed. Nothing was working in my life. Let me tell you. I've told many of you about my situation. The first crusade we went for, we were few. God did great things. We were few. We were in debt. But there was an anointing. I would have given up and said, God, please. Today, you are benefactors of endurance. A product of pain. Listen, I bring a message to someone. You want to live effectively? Master the art of enduring pain until you overcome. You can weary pain. You can weary failure. Failure can salute you and say you qualify to pass. Are we together? I won't give up. Lord, I won't give up. I'll keep pressing on till my answer comes. I won't give up. Lord, I won't give up. I'll keep holding on. went to lay hands on a sick body and they embarrassed you. They drove you out of a house. You went to pray innocently. Your word of knowledge was not correct and they drove you out. They called you a false prophet. Don't worry. You know you are real. Just leave. They can embarrass you. Just go. You took your CV and they sought that class and they insulted you. They say all these prostitutes that roam around university and buy certificates. No problem. Just leave. A day will come it will be a privilege for them to shake your hands. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Listen. In Koinonia, we don't run away from people who have failed. This is a place where there are pastors who run away from people who fail. When a drummer cannot play drums well, he says, drive this guy out of my church. Go and look for somebody in Lagos who can play and then bring the person. Right? There are pastors who cannot train people who have failed to become great men of God. We want ready-made. Great leaders are those who can endure and make wonders out of failures. Hallelujah. There are all kinds of people you would have thought they would fail. Right here in Koinonia, there are people who have gone through things that it looks like the morning will not rise. I'll never forget one of our own here, Mama. I remember when he was disowned by his family on account of his faith. Disowned completely. They drive you and say, that's it, go. Live your life. I remember him coming and smiling. But today, look what God has made out of his life. And on the, that failure today has become an instrument for his anointing. That failure today has become an instrument of his grace. Sister, you don't have to give yourself cheap because of failure. Go through it. Pass through it. There are some cups you will never pray them away from your life. I promise you. 
Master or Father, if it be thy will, take this cup off me. And God says, uh -uh, you must drink this one. If you want to stay near me, you must drink of my cup and be baptized with my baptism. There are some things you can never pray away. You pray for grace to pass through them. Isaiah 43 verse 1 and 2, fear not, I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Through the rivers, it will not overwhelm you. He said, when you walk through the fire, you will run. While it is burning you, you will walk through the fire. He says, I'll be with you. Have you walked through fire enough to have compassion for people? That's the reason why when I come in and I see people seated outside, I, I, I see people standing in the rain, my heart is grieved because I know that I do not even, based on human parameters, I should never be trusted with people like this. I don't just walk around bragging and saying, this is the man of God, all of you shift, you came late, sit down outside. It's, no, 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 no. It touches my heart. Many times you see me sit down and I bend my head. Many people don't know there is a very soft side to me. Many times I'm fighting tears when I see what God is doing. I come for the miracle service and the testimonies from one region over the other. I know where God brought me from. If I never failed, I would have been an arrogant person. Not with the kind of anointing. I had to fail to manage this kind of anointing. It takes failure to have this kind of anointing and still respect people. Are you getting what I'm saying? The reason why there are many young ministers moving around, bragging and moving. Just don't try to pray for them. Just leave them. If it is that gate, I promise you, you must pass through the door of failure. Expect people to laugh at you is normal. They laugh at you as a consolation to their failures. Because they have refused to move forward. Whenever they see you trying, they are intimidated. So when you fail, it's a comfort to them. And so they will amplify it so that they can derive joy that it is not doable. But when you smash that record, them together with the world will stand in ovation. The reason why you reward great men is not just their result. You, they are testaments of endurance. They have gone through what people have never gone through. If I never failed, I would not know how to fast. There are times in my life I fasted dry for days because I needed to knock on the doors of heaven. It's not just that I just love God. Situations push me like the cave of Adulam. We are going to pray. You want to live effectively? You must have an understanding about the gift of failure. The gift of life. The gift of people. The gift of failure. Listen, I want you to go back home and strangely thank God. For the gift of failure some of you the only nobody knew that you would humble yourself and come to church because you used to take first position in secondary school when you entered 100 level you were bragging around five carryovers bam two carryovers bam oh god i need you and you came your failure has brought you to a point let's look at genesis 50 verse 20 and then we'll just pray I know our time is gone, but this is a very important message. I have one more, but we'll take that another time. Your understanding on greatness and success. Genesis 15 verse 20. This is what Joseph told his brothers. Look at me. This is what you will tell everybody mocking you today when you succeed. You don't have the evidence to talk to them now. Don't bother defending yourself. Let them call you names. But Joseph told his brothers, he said, but as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Sister, your disappointment is because there is a mantle upon you. It's not beans to be a woman of God. That guy walked out on you. Everybody insulted you. Just continue loving God. A day will come when somebody runs to you and says, Mama, can you imagine what happened to me? You will start crying and say, I remember this pain. I have it too. I went through it. Those who cannot counsel people are those who don't have their pain. Their compassion is the capacity to be touched 
with the feelings of infirmity. There are others, for instance, who say, why waste time on people? Why waste time? Leave them alone. It's because you have not failed. When you see us, I wait after service, no matter how hungry and tired I am, to see people. 1 a.m., 2 a.m., I'm responding to calls. It's because I know what it means to cry and nobody answer you. I know what it means to turn to your father and he says, I'm disappointed. You don't have a future like they've done for some of you right now. Some of you, you are sitting down on your own. Nobody believes in you. I'm telling you, Koinonia believes in you. I believe in you. Yet I don't care what is wrong in your life. If you have an ear and you have two legs, oh, you can come back to life. After the dust settles, they will see a giant imagine. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God Through it all Through it all I've learned to trust in Jesus Every day That's why you see some of our mothers Listen You see some of our mothers get to a point where They can be passing the road And you will see a baby fall down and they will leave what they are doing and come back and you are like, mommy, please, I have an appointment. She waited 15 years before you came. She knows what it means. She knows the value of a child. Are you getting what I'm saying? 15 years of mockery. They threaten her that they will throw her away. And so every time she sees a child, she's touched with that feeling. You will never be a man of God. Let me tell you, for those of you who like claiming apostle, part of the apostolic ministry is that you will be passed through the pain of many people if you do not know know it now if you think you will wear suit and prophesy you are joking you will be subjected to many problems you don't have issues with because you need that pain i've gone through too many things in my life that's why when people cry i am touched i can leave anything i'm doing there are people who ring my phone 2 30 3 30 maybe i'm trying to rest or and i see five six missed calls and i'm tired but i pick up the call and they say man of god somebody is about to die and i remember there was a time i was nothing that's why when i come for koinonia forget about all this water oh, and protocol and this is excellence you see the way i sit down my mind is on what i'm going to tell you right if there is no pulpit i will use that's why you see me i come with my notebook you see how old this notebook is? This notebook is a treasure. If my house is catching fire, I'll carry my notebook, my laptop, and my phone. Everything should burn into ashes there. Yeah. Because failure has taught me what is important in my life. When I failed, the truths in these books were the things that brought me back. Are you hearing what I'm saying now? It's easy for you to see what God is doing now. To see the wonders and think that's how I started. No. There was a time I prayed for sick bodies and nothing happened. Are you getting me? There was a time I didn't see any vision. People were claiming they were seeing visions. I knew I cannot tell lies. And so I waited. There was a time people were running and God said, you stay. You can't run the way they are running. Someone saw me and said, man of God, what is a car? What is this? I told the person, if you go through what I've gone through, will not have meaning for these things believe me when i tell you this what have you gone through that has made you wise age does not necessarily bring wisdom failure can accelerate your wisdom a thousand times there is a way you fail your way to wisdom are you are you with me now i'm speaking my heart to you we are going to pray i know that our time is gone but tonight, I want you to go back and thank God for your failures. We love people when we fail. We have compassion for people when we fail. When a man of God sees a sick body, because you have never really been sick, you see a sick body and you try to pray for her and she's not healed. The humility to say, please take her to the hospital. You now start shouting on a sick person. You don't have faith. You, are, you can't prove I'm not anointed. Look, I know I'm anointed. That man has not failed. The day you are standing on stage and the last thing you can remember is you had like a slap. 
and with all your anointing, they, they say you stand up and you see that you are taking the third drink. You will know that failure is not next. When you are sick, it's not necessarily that you don't have faith. Huh? God forbid. What, what do we need doctors for? Me, hospital. The day, the day something obvious happens, like, like your eye or your head swells up before your members, not something you can cover. And they say, man of God, what is all this one that we are seeing? Your head is, is swelling. I mean, come on. We know what you have preached. We, we know the strength and the dexterity of your doctrine. What is happening? When you defy explanation, every doctor you see, you say you are a gift. You are an expression of God's mercy. People speak carnally and callously because they have not gone through anything. You see a beautiful lady frying a cara and you turn and you say, I mean, come on, how can a beautiful lady like this be frying a cara? It's because your father is alive. It's because your mother is alive. It's because your state government is giving you scholarship. You don't know what has happened to that lady. She turned down a millionaire and said, I'd rather fry a cara with dignity. But because maybe you are seeing them in Koinonia, you see a pretty lady like this, and tomorrow she's frying a car and she sees you and she says, Bless you. Tell her you're a member of Koinonia. And you say, Ah, Kai, I, I, I should change your story. I'm embarrassed. I mean, is the word not working? Continue talking like that. <laughs> Listen, when you fail, you love people. When you fail, when people cry, you don't say they are acting. There are times the only voice of your pain is your tears. Your mouth cannot speak. Only a man who has gone through pain can understand the language. While you cry, they are hearing what you are saying. And they know. And they can wrap their hands around you and say, look, I know I was going for lunch. Lunch cancelled because there is a life here that must change. Rise up on your feet. Two prayer points very quickly and we're out. Lift your voice and thank the Lord for the teaching tonight. Oh, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Your grace, your grace, Lord, I'm nothing without you. Your grace, your grace, shines on me prayer point number one lord grant me wisdom from tonight lift your voice and pray please everyone make sure you pray grace to evaluate your life grace to evaluate your life grace to evaluate your life shake it Grace to evaluate my life, oh God. Grace to change my mindset. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'd like you to pray and say, Father, grant me grace to maximize the gift of life, the gift of people, and the gift of failure. Lift your voice and pray. Let me not waste it. My life is a gift. My life is a trust. No more wasting time. No more wasting destiny. Are you praying, Koinonia? Thank you, oh God, for teaching me about people. That people can disappoint me. That people can change. Lift your voice and pray. Thank you, Father, for helping me understand the priceless gift of failure on my path to destiny. The priceless gift of failure that I can fail forward, that I can fail into greatness. Thank you for everything I have gone through. I cried. But I give you the praise for it. I wept. But I give you the praise for it. Lord, I thank you for what looked like a delay in my life. I thank you 
for what looked like a challenge in my life it's made me wiser it's made me patient it's made me kind it's made me compassionate hallelujah hallelujah let's add one more prayer point quickly i'd like you to pray and say father every lesson that my failures and my pain have brought to my life i receive grace to see it and receive i endure the shame i endure the mockery i endure the misunderstandings go ahead and pray every lesson that pain has brought to my life every lesson the lessons of love the lessons of wisdom the lessons of kindness the lessons of endurance the lessons of humility hallelujah hallelujah lift your hands as i pray for you while i do that please let's be patient to hear the announcement and as soon as i pray for you all those who are worshiping with us for the first time i know that here is crowded but just make your way to the front we want to welcome you you are very important to us there was a time we did not have you and although we are out of time we will not trivialize your presence so while we are doing that just make your way to the front others lift your hands first timers please make your way to the front you're welcome lift your hands father in the name of jesus christ i pray for your people lord tonight there are people in this place who are carrying bleeding hearts there are people in this place who have failed many times like jabez they have named them after their sorrows but lord i pray that tonight let this message restore hope to them in the name of jesus christ there are people who have been disappointed again and again as a result of the inconsistencies of men now oh god you have taught us how human beings behave may we never be shocked at the behavior of people again in the name of jesus christ and father i pray that you teach us the wisdom for living that life is a trust and life is a gift help us to appreciate it at all times in the mighty name of jesus christ Let's celebrate those who are worshiping with us for the first time. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much for coming. Um, we really appreciate you. This is Koinonia. God bless you. We honor you for coming all the way. Some of you traveled from states, from regions. Thank you for coming.